It seemed to me, right, from looking at a lot of the narrative games that were coming out at that time, um, you know, there were companies like Cinemaware, I don't know if you remember that or not, but the, 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 I really kind of looked at it as, as, a, as it seems like several of these games just wanted to be movies and um, they, they couldn't go make movies, so they'll make games, which is a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do. Um, and that's where the kind of movie envy, you know, thing came from a little bit. And I even saw that within Lucasfilm games. You know, there, there was this, it's certainly when you're a small little piece of this very large company that's known for Star Wars and Indiana Jones and making movies, there's a little bit of that. Um, and I think that drove most of the people in the games group, you know, to want to do games that at least had a good narrative component to them was was kind of was being a part of Lucasville. This is an interview with Ron Gilbert. Ron is a game designer known for games like Maniac Mansion, The Secret of Monkey Island, and Monkey Island 2. He talks about the early days at Lucasfilm, how he creates puzzles in his games, and how he tackles comedy. Ron, thank you for agreeing to talk. Uh, I'm excited to speak with you. I've been playing your games quite a bit since I was a kid and uh, always appreciated your approach to game design and writing and comedy. So I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you again. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Should be fun. Would you mind just talking about your childhood and what influenced you? You know, when I was, I guess, in junior high school, you know, um, a friend and I started making home movies, right? And this was this was before videotape. This is you know Super Eight movies that you know we actually had to edit by splicing the film together. And we started making a lot of um, you know a lot of these movies, very very much inspired by you know Star Wars having just come out, and so everything we did was some space movie of of some kind or another. And I was very very interested in that. You know, making those movies was a lot of fun, um, and I really enjoyed the kind of creative process of filming them and putting them together. And um, I didn't, I didn't really understand, you know, editing techniques. You know, it's like we shot movies literally from the beginning to the end, um, and so stuff like that I didn't really, you know, know yet because I had no, no training and nobody to to talk to or, and there was no internet. So there really was no way to even read about this stuff. Um, but I was, you know, very interested in it, the creative part of, uh, you know, making those movies, you know, in junior high school was, was very fun. You know, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think when I was in junior high school, um, I really wanted to go to film school. You know, when I when I got to college, I wanted to go to film school. And again, that was very much inspired by Star Wars and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and all these people. Um, I read a lot of books about them, you know, about, about the, how they made movies and, and them growing up. And I really wanted to go to film school. Um, and then computers happened, right? Then, then I was kind of introduced to computers and programming and um, you know, when you're a kid and, and you have a computer, the, the thing you want to do is make, is make games, right? You don't want to make accounting software. You want to make games. And so I would, I would make games mostly trying to replicate the games I went down and played in the arcades. I would then come home on my home computer and I would try to, try to replicate them. And I think that just totally hijacked my I want to go to film school. Because now there was this whole other creative outlet for me, which was making games um, that really just kind of sucked all my attention away. Did you, uh, when you were making Super 8 films, because filmmaking, a lot of storytelling is puzzle, is puzzle solving. Did you plan out the plot or the story beforehand and plan out the solutions or did you do a kind of ad hoc? No, we definitely planned it out. I mean, my friend and I actually wrote scripts, you know, so we knew what was going to be said. We knew where the movie was going. So we, we did plan that out. You know, we didn't just start a camera rolling and kind of go where we went. Um, we, we definitely had, you know, had good ideas. You wrote that article about why adventure games suck. You wrote about Hollywood envy 
at the time. Do you think that the same kind of ideas were circulating in other game developers' heads at the time, which was how do I turn this game into Hollywood storytelling like Star Wars? I mean, it, it seemed to me, right, from looking at a lot of the narrative games that were coming out at that time, um, you know, there were companies like Cinemaware, I don't know if you remember that or not, but the, 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 I really kind of looked at it as, as, a, as it seems like several of these games just wanted to be movies and um, they, they couldn't go make movies, so they'll make games, which is a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do. Um, and that's where the kind of movie envy, you know, thing came from a little bit. And I even saw that within Lucasfilm games, you know, there, there was this, certainly when you're a small little piece of this very large company that's known for Star Wars and Indiana Jones and making movies, there's a little bit of that. Um, and I think that drove most of the people in the games group, you know, to want to do games that at least had a good narrative component to them was was kind of was being a part of Lucasfilm. And so when you signed on to do Lucasfilm games, um, that must have been a shock as a fan of those films growing up. You talk about how Spielberg would call you <laughs> to uh, to get solutions to puzzles on your games. Um, when you were working on Maniac Mansion, was that was that the first time you made the Scum engine? Yes. Yeah, Scum stands for Scriptcation Utility for Maniac Mansion. And, you know, I started building Maniac Mansion just writing the whole thing in 6502 assembly language. And that became very, very clear very early on that that was just not going to work, right? It was, it was too complicated to hand code everything in assembly language. And that's when uh, another, um, another member of the games group named Chip Morningstar um, he was a very kind of computer science -y, you know, kind of person. He was the one that suggested, well, you should just do a, a, an interpreted language. And that's when I started looking at it a lot more. And I realized, oh, well, Infocom, uh, or Info, uh, yeah, Infocom had done, you know, a scripting language for their text adventures. And I started doing a lot of research into it and realized, oh, that is, that is actually the way this should happen. With those early text adventure games, um... It was so frustrating because you would use what was seemingly coherent speech that the interpreter just couldn't comprehend. Right. Presumably scum was a resolution to this problem in, in essence. Yeah, in, in a way, right? Um, I I was never a really big fan of text adventures, right? I liked I played a lot of the original adventure, you know, that appeared on college mainframes when you know I was in college and stuff. Um, and, and I did enjoy that, but I really didn't get into the text adventures. Um, and I think a lot of it was that I just, I didn't enjoy the typing, right? Not, not the physical typing, but I really didn't enjoy, you know, having to, what, what I kind of called second guess the parser, right? Because I couldn't just type what I wanted. Um, maybe you do, you could do that today, you know, with, with AI and stuff like that, but but you really couldn't. And you were kind of working in this like pigeon English, right? You know, open door, push block, pick up cage. Um, and it was really this kind of verb now, right? It's, it's, and I mean, that, that's the way those, those, those um, scripting languages are even constructed, right? That you had a verb, it would decide, and a noun, it would decide. And it kind of occurred to me that there really weren't that many verbs anyway. Right. If you look at all the different things you could do, and that's where the you know the limited set of nine or so verbs for maniac mansion came from. That's what I distilled it down to. That with these verbs, you really can do everything you need to do. And why not just put them right on the screen? So there's no there's no guessing what you do. And you just you click on the verb you want, and then you go to the screen, you click on the object you want. And now you don't have to guess whether the designer called it a bush or a plant or a tree or a shrub. You just click on it and, and it worked. And I think a lot of that just stems from um, you know, my impatience. I'm a very impatient person, right? I don't, when I sit down to play a game, I don't want to have to really work at that, right? I, li I like working at it and figuring out the narrative and figuring out the puzzles, but I don't want to have to 
struggle my way through a user interface. And a lot of the games I, I abandon very quickly just because the user interface is bad. Can you talk more about how you distilled the verbs down to, was it 12 verbs in Maniac Mansion? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there was like new kid and there were a couple of things. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was yeah, nine or 11 or something. Yeah, you can use 12 in Monkey Island. I mean, what, were, were there some verbs that almost made it, but ended up on the cutting room floor? Uh, you know, we had we had verbs in Maniac Mansion like fix, um, which in retrospect probably could have gone away. Um, uh, I think that's only because we had a very specific Thing, you know, you had the phone to fix, and and so that kind of stayed in. But in in retrospect, that that probably could have gone away of the stuff. But I, I think it was you know anything that was very specific. You know, we tried to get the very general purpose verbs, right? And fix is probably the most specific thing that, that we actually had. I don't remember um, the actual verbs. I have actually have a document where where there were like 15 verbs in an early interface thing. I guess I could go dig that up and see what they were, but yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. What that did was it made, uh, even though you're in just one building in Maniac Mansion, you've got seven characters to pick from and you have 12 verbs and all these other objects. And it's almost like an infinite number of combinations that you can make right. if made it actually was like world building in a sense yeah yeah in a way it's i, I you know i looked at maniac manager early on as it was a simulation right i wanted i wanted the house in maniac mansion to be something that felt like you were in a real place and everything worked and you know, you know, whether it's opening the door to the microwave or the refrigerator, doing stuff. And and that also came from, you know, the characters, um, you know, the family moving around the house and doing things. And and I just I just kind of felt that, oh, there's this house and it's really working, you know, behind the scenes. And and it isn't. I mean, in reality, that is not what is happening, what's going on, but it, it felt like that's what the game should be in a way. Is just kind of moving away through this simulation of this of this working house. As a kid, when I was playing Maniac Mansion, I was young. I was about six at the time, and um, it felt daunting because it did feel like I was playing an action game, and I wasn't. But it felt like I was, and the the game doesn't have action scenes, um, and we'll get into the action scenes in your later games as well. Was that a conscious decision on your part to not do action scenes in Maniac Mansion? I think that was just a personal thing. You know, the, the games that I was really gravitating to at the time weren't action games, right? They, they were a little more of, of the narrative stuff. And, and it, it felt to me that, you know, if you're, if you're making a game that is primarily about puzzle solving and doing a story, that that is a particular skill set and playing an action game is also a particular skill set and i'm not sure there's much of an overlap between those two things and there certainly isn't in me so i just i just kind of skew away from doing that stuff so after this came zach mccracken um, the wikipedia says that you convinced the devs to add comedy to the game is that true uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's if that's necessarily true. I mean, David Fox has worked on Maniac Mansion, so he was well versed in the comedy, and he did a bunch of stuff in that game. It was very funny. So, um, I, I I don't specifically remember that. Um, I would find that hard to believe that, that David was going to go do a super serious game until I came along. Just broadly speaking, and this goes back to Maniac Mansion, also what like how do you make a joke like this does it start does it start with something that you just think of like that'll be funny and you try and put it into the game or is the process backwards or do you talk to a bunch of people and try and figure out funny solutions to things um there's probably a, a couple of different things that happen there's there's you know funny puzzles funny environmental things um 
And, you know, those come from different places. You know, a, a lot of the environmental stuff, right? If I, if I go and I look at Maniac Man or go, go look at Monkey Island, right? A whole lot of humor from Monkey Island came from Steve Purcell because he was the artist and he was drawing stuff and he would just draw funny stuff. And, and a lot of times, you know, I would see that stuff and I go, okay, well, well, we have to do something with that now. That's so funny that it's now going to become an object. And I mean, even things like the rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle, um, I don't remember that specifically, but it would not surprise me at all if, if Steve had just drawn that, you know, into that scene and then it had to become something. So sometimes things come from artists, especially since you know, these type of adventure games are very visual. Um, so there's a lot of art stuff going on. Some of that stuff comes from artists. Some of it just comes from, you know, playing around with code, starting to implement something. Um, and then there's the the second part is is the writing, right? When you're actually sitting out writing something, um, I think, I mean, I think you're just thinking of that. I don't think there is... I don't think there is a, is a is a magic formula for being funny you know, necessarily. I think you just are funny, and when you're writing, you just start to write funny stuff. I, I've certainly tried to write serious things, you know, serious stories, and I can't do it. Um, I'm I'm five minutes into writing my serious, you know, opening, and it's just and I'm and I'm interjecting humor into the thing. It's almost like as you are, um, as you're writing what you expect the audience to expect, you just want to subvert that mm -hmm. right away at every turn possible. It's like actually being being serious seems to lead to way more humor. <laughs> With, right. yeah. Well, you know, I've always said that adventure games, there's an absurdity to it, right? You are going around and you're you're picking up everything you can find you're basically looting people's houses when you go into it you're you're doing weird bizarre things even if you're trying to build a completely serious adventure game you are putting the character and the player in a situation where they're doing absurd things and it's one of the reasons that i've always thought adventure games work well as comedies because you're putting people into an absurd situation anyway. So let's let's make fun of it. Do you think part of that absurdity came from technological limitations at the time? Well, it was certainly the, you know, the technology, the technological limitations of just a parser, right? That that you you can't actually say anything you want. You have a very limited set of verbs that you can communicate with. And so that, you know, that that kind of does it. I mean, Infocom, when they were doing you know, text adventures, I mean, they had serious games, you know, like Brian Moriarty's Trinity. And they also had really funny games, you know, that Steve Moretzky did. And, and I look at, you know, Steve and Brian, and, you know, Steve is a very funny guy. You know, if you hang out with him, he's, he's funny. Brian, um, although he has kind of a, a, a nice, you know, sense of humor to him, he is much more of a serious person, right? He enjoys writing serious stuff and telling serious stories and he's very good at it so i think it's just whoever's building this thing um that you're kind of like doing it's going to gravitate towards the serious or the or the comedic my broader question there is as technology allows us to make things that are way more realistic do you think that people are trying to be more serious and sort of negating being funny well, we certainly have the ability to, right? I mean, back in the 1990s, um, because of the limited art stuff, it was a much easier to draw um, more comical stuff, more cartoon, right? We were basically, we were at the you know cartoon level of stuff. And now, you know, you have games that are highly rendered in 3D and they can be a lot more serious. And so it, I think it's easier to write you know, a serious game, you know, like The Last of Us or whatever, because you can portray everything in this highly realistic stuff, which honestly doesn't really appeal to me. You know, I look at these games and I'm not, I'm not really kind of driven to them because they are so hyper-realistic. And, 
is kind of like where you have you know photography, which is incredibly realistic, and then you've got these games that are trying to be realistic, but they're just not. You know, um, the environments are getting very good, but the people are just not there. You know, and 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 so that always kind of puts a wedge for me because I'm looking at this thing going, yeah, this is not really realistic. I would much rather that I the, there was three the three D that was more stylized or humorous and like I'm I'm much more driven to the three D that's in World of Warcraft than I am the three D that's in you know in these other games because there is kind of this weird comical um, piece of the World of Warcraft three D. Let's go to uh, Indiana Jones: The Last Crusade. You're a writer on this. Uh, working with Spielberg directly, I assume? Uh, in, indirectly. Indirectly, okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we were working on it and um, he came by a couple of times and looked at the game and stuff, but he wasn't, you know, in there coming up with puzzles and stuff. <laughs> uh, what, what, what was the writing process like working on an existing property that had a huge fan base already? There's a lot of expectations there. Yeah, that was a hard one. You know, I did that game with uh, David Fox and Noah Falstein. And um, I think we kind of all did pieces. I mean, Noah, Noah did a bunch of writing and I did and David did and game design. So it really was kind of the, the three of us really um, working on that. And, you know, we, we knew that um, we had to be careful with that title. And we were definitely doing an adventure game. We weren't doing an action game. Um, but we knew, we knew we had to be careful. We had to be authentic to Indiana Jones. We couldn't turn him into a slapstick buffoon because that would be funny. He could not become, you know, a guy rush three foot. And so we always had that going on, but we also knew that we didn't want to just replicate the movie. You know, we didn't want to to have have a bunch of scenes that appeared exactly like in the movie and all you were doing was was really just playing the movie. We wanted to have different pieces of, of the game. So when you played the game, you felt like you were seeing something new, you know, the, the, even if you'd seen the movie beforehand. So we were, very, we were very conscious of that. And, you know, we were a part of Lucasfilm and I think that also brought this, we have to, you know, treat this thing seriously, right? It wasn't just a licensed product that we were getting from someone else. Did you uh, did you ever encounter any resistance when you were trying to say add comedy in places where they didn't want it? I don't remember any cases where they told us not to do anything. I think we were kind of our own our own little censorship, you know, as we were kind of looking at that stuff. But yeah, we we I mean we never really had to um, get approval from anybody on stuff. Or at least if that was happening, um, we kind of weren't aware of it. It was all happening behind the scenes. So this is one of the few LucasArts games that has action scenes that require some level of timing. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, a, there's a fighting game engine in it, essentially. Uh, do, you, do you know why they decided to put that engine into this game? Well, it felt, it felt like it was Indiana Jones, right? And there is kind of an action component to him. And you know, it was something that you know we talked, David and Noah and I talked a lot about. And if, if you look at the Indiana Jones game, there were there were three different paths that you could go. You could you could follow more of a storytelling path or a puzzle solving or an action path. So if you wanted to do the action sequences, you know, fighting the guards in the castle and stuff, you could do that, or you could solve all those puzzles through puzzle solving. And, and that was the thing that kind of, I think made it okay for us was that you could do it, but it was optional. And it wasn't optional, like you would now have less of a game if you didn't do it because the action sequences were replaced with puzzle solving. So you'd, you'd still have a deep game no matter which of those paths that you chose. Is this kind of a similar process that you used when doing the Maniac Mansion game with the multiple characters? Yeah, I mean, kind of, um, except, you know, the combat is very different than a puzzle. So, 
you know, it is a, you know, this or that you need to do. But, um, you know, with Maniac Mansion, the alternate puzzles were really required puzzles if you had chose certain characters, right? It wasn't, you couldn't solve a puzzle this way or this way or that way. You had to solve it this way because of the characters that you had chosen. So would you say that Maniac Mansion was a more difficult uh, writing process <laughs> than Indiana Jones? I, th I think it was, but mostly because, you know, Gary and I had never made an adventure game before. And, you know, the whole design of Maniac Mansion was a complete mess. And because we just did not know what we were doing. And um, in some ways, I think that was good, right? Because we, we tried a lot of weird things and we failed on a bunch of them, but I think other parts of them succeeded wonderfully. And we just, we really just did not know what we were doing when we were building that game. And I think by the time Indiana Jones rolled around, we knew a lot more about what we were doing. So, you know, David didn't know, and I could really approach that from a much more kind of analytical point. Um, we knew what puzzles worked. We knew the kind of narrative that worked. Well, we just didn't know any of that in Maniac Mansion. Were there any key examples of things that you took from Maniac Mansion and applied to Indiana Jones and things that you thought, like, we're never doing that again? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, multiple characters is, is really difficult. Um, having a bunch of different characters, you are designing a, a bunch of different puzzles. Um, and I think it's one of the things that, I mean, you kind of notice after Maniac Mansion, we didn't, we didn't really do that very much, right? The Day of the Tentacle had some character switching, but they locked it down to three characters and only three characters. And, and I think that was one of those things we realized just what a complete, you know, mess that was. Um, that we just, we really didn't want to do that anymore. Um, the other thing me I mentioned had is there were a lot of death and dead ends, right? There were a lot of places you could get to in that game where you had solved some puzzle incorrectly in the past, and now there was just nothing you could do except load a save game from a previous game. And if you look at like the Sierra online games at the time, I mean, that was their bread and butter, right? They just did that. And it was almost a very conscious effort. And by the time by the time Indiana Jones rolled around, we really kind of shied away from that. And when Indiana Jones was being done, that's when I wrote that whole thing about why adventure games suck. You know, it was it was, it was during the in an in Indiana Jones game. So I think that game is just a little more of a kind of lockdown game in that in that respect. Not only were you trying to keep people from simply dying, were you also trying to keep gamers from getting stuck without solutions to puzzles? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's the same it's the same thing in some ways, right? Whether I guess I guess dying is actually better because you instantly know the game is over, um, as opposed to uh, oh, I forgot to pick up the pencil when I was in New York, and now I'm totally screwed. Fourteen hours later. So I guess dying is better <laughs> than, um, than that way, which I guess is a little bit different than being stuck, right? Stuck, stuck to me is like, okay, the game is not in a deadlock situation, but we've set up a situation that's so obscure that nobody is going to figure it out without going to a hint book. Right. Even though there is a solution there is what yeah. you're saying. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I bought a lot. I bought a lot of hint books for Sierra games. That's for sure. I think yeah. I think that those games were really eighty dollar games in the end. Because <laughs> how else were you gonna? Quick, quick question: Did you ever watch the Maniac Mansion TV show? And was there any? Did the Maniac Mansion TV show come before or after the game? After. So it's based on the game. Oh yeah, definitely. But believe it or not. <laughs> Yeah, the, the TV show is interesting because there was a the, they they were going to do a TV show because Lucas and I had this little TV show unit. Um, they were actually right upstairs from us at the time, and 
they wanted to do a Mania Adventure TV show. And, you know, of course, Gary and I were thrilled. It's like, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be a Mania Adventure TV show. And it took, you know, a good year or so, you know, to work through development and all these things. And it was kind of amusing because we would get these little updates on what was going on. We had no say. Nobody ever asked our opinion. We had no ability to reject anything. And, you know, the the, the first stuff we got, it was very similar to the TV, to the, to the game. And then we would get these little periodic updates from them talking about changes. And we could just see how this thing was just drifting away to the point that I think there's a Dr. Fred in the TV show, but that's really kind of about it. You know, and so it, it was it was amusing to us, right? It was a, it was a little bit of a um, disappointment, but I think it was amusing just to see all these changes go through and just and it slowly drift away from the from the show. Yeah, it was confusing because I remember seeing the show before the game, and my oh, dad really? and I watched because yeah, we were just fans of SCTV and Joe Flaherty, and you know loved watching him. So anything he did, we thought was gold, and we watched Maniac Mansion. What it was a very strange, <laughs> very strange show, uh, but it worked, I guess. But then when I I saw that there was a game, I thought that the game was based off the show, and I played the game. Oh. <laughs> like, well, where's Joe Flaherty? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So is this is this the first mo- show or movie based on a game i don't know that's a good question i mean i i gotta believe with the with the huge you know atari craze that happened in the 80s and stuff that some movie tv show must have made the space invaders saturday morning cartoon or something dumb like that um but i i don't really know off the top of my head did, did you go on to do Loom next or was Monkey Island next? Uh, I didn't really do Loom. I mean, Brian really did all of Loom. Um, I supported him because it was all done in the SCUM system and he needed changes to the engine, you know, because his interface was very different and he had some other stuff. So I was, I was implementing changes to the SCUM engine for him, but I had no real creative um, contribution to that game that was that was all brian's the chronology of it was that i did maniac mansion and then i spent a bunch of time trying to come up with a new game and i had lots of weird ideas um and then i came up with with um monkey island and so i spent a bunch of time working through uh monkey island and kind of trying different avenues, different stories. I wasn't really sure what I wanted it to be yet. Um, I had some ideas that really weren't working, other ideas that were. And it was at that point that um, Steve Arnold, who is the head of the Lucasfilm Games Group, approached David and Noah and I um, about doing Indiana Jones. Because if I remember correctly, they had licensed the uh, Jones game out to someone else and they just weren't actually doing anything. And so they pulled it back in house, but they, we, we only had like nine months to make that whole game before the movie came out. And so we were kind of this strike force that was gonna go make this game really, really quickly. And so I put Monkey Allen on hold while I did um, Indiana Jones which I think was good for a couple of reasons. I think I learned a lot about game design and venture game design during the Indiana Jones. Um, I also read the book on Stranger Tides, which really solidified me about what Monkey Island needed to be. Um, and so I, and I also read that article about why adventure games suck, which really became this kind of game design Bible for, for Monkey Island. So I think, you know, being, being, um, putting McAllen aside for a bit and working on Indiana Jones was actually a really, really good thing for Monkey Island. So when you're writing a game like Monkey Island, you know, when we write a film script, uh, we'll write a treatment, beat sheet, and then we'll go to 90 page, 110 page script. Is there a script for Monkey Island? Um, The way that I approach designing adventure games is I build the thing that's called the puzzle dependency chart. And it is, a, it is basically a flow chart, but in reverse. 
So it's not a timeline. You, do, you don't say, oh, I go from A to B. You look at it backwards, which is to accomplish puzzle A, I must have first done puzzle B. And so it's this inverted flow chart. And I always start with that because that that is, I mean, there's kind of a rough outline of the story, but honestly, it's, it's probably not even two pages long. And um, then I do the puzzle dependency chart. And then from the puzzle dependency chart, all these puzzles emerge. Then it's fitting the narrative around those puzzles. How did you come up with a puzzle dependency chart? That was something that I had not used before Maniac Mansion. And um, there was a piece of software on the Mac, I mean, very early Macs. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was basically a piece of scheduling software. You would use it to like schedule a project, which is probably why we had it uh, you know, on the computers at the time. And I remember playing around with that. And the thing that was really amazing to me about it is you connected two tasks up for your schedule. It, it, when you made that connection, it completely rebuilt the chart on the fly. So I was kind of looking at that, realizing, oh, well, this is exactly what puzzles are. And I don't have to painstakingly adjust every node if I connect two puzzles up that are a long ways apart, the, the, the software just did that all automatically for me. And that's where I kind of became really intrigued by this idea of just doing the puzzles. So I built all of the puzzles in Maniac Mansion as a Benzi chart. And I literally printed them out. I had this like giant, like 30 foot strip of paper that wrapped around my office that was the whole puzzle of Benzi chart for Monkey Island. Now, did you keep it and make a book out of it? That sounds really Oh, of course cool. not. No, I, I probably threw it away. <laughs> what was inspiring you with your puzzles at the time? I mean, were you, did you play puzzles a lot as a kid or was there some hobby that you had? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, that, that's a really good question. You know, I played a lot of the original adventure, you know, which was a bunch of puzzles. I think, you know, when, when Gary and I first started coming up with Maniac Ninja, right, we, we had this idea that it was this kind of spoof on B-horror movies, right? We both, Gary and I, love B-horror movies. So we were going to do this thing called Maniac Mansion and, you know, about these kids that go into this mansion. At the time, the kids were much younger. I think they were siblings, you know, um, and they're going to kind of go into this mansion and do this stuff and, we we you know, we spent a lot of time on the idea and the story, and Gary drew a bunch of art, but we really didn't know what the game was. You know, we didn't know whether we're making a real action game or arcade game. We just had no idea what we were doing, and that was when, for Christmas, I went down to my um, aunt and uncle, and my um, cousin was playing King's Quest. Right? He was eight years old, and he was playing King's Quest. And I'd never seen King's Quest before that. And I watched him play this game and it really just dawned on me, this is what Maniac Mansion needs to be. And that was where, you know, Gary, when I came home from Christmas, it's like Gary and I re-looked at this whole thing as this kind of environment with this series of these puzzles and, and just started kind of making up puzzles with, with no real understanding of what we were doing, right? We were just kind of, kind of grabbing, oh, this this seems like a fun puzzle um, and just and just started doing it. So I don't think there was a, the, I mean, there certainly wasn't like a grand scheme going on with the Maniac Mansion. It was just, it was just two guys trying not to get fired. <laughs> it's a great name for a company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what was, what was the environment like at work after when you're making Maniac Mansion, it's clearly not just a, a riff off of King's Quest because you have a verb system, even though King's Quest has that. I assume you're talking about the- uh, It was the very first King's Quest, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, text-based commands. And so you're you're the first one that implements a linguistic GUI. Yeah, probably to that extent. I mean, certainly other games that come along that had um, 
you know, more visual interfaces. But I, I think what we were doing with that, we were probably the first game to do that, certainly at that scale. What was the response like to that? Um, like within Lucasfilm, um, you know, I, it was a very small group of people at the time, right? There's maybe 10 or 12 people at most, you know, in Lucasfilm games. And we were all very collaborative, right? There was a lot of talking back and forth. So Gary and I weren't making Maniac Mansion in a vacuum, right? We were, they were talking to Noah and obviously Chip and Doug Crockford and all these other people. Um, things were kind of being bounced around and bantied around. And and there was no like green light for Maniac Mansion, right? If Gary and I never put together a proposal that we shopped to the executives. And, and it, it really felt to me that at the time, games became games just because everybody got excited about them. If enough people in the games group were excited about your idea, then it would kind of become an official project. And it certainly felt like that's what happened with Maniac Mansion. You know, everybody got excited about it because Gary and I were showing everybody what we were doing. And then, you know, Steve kind of said, yeah, let's, let's make this a real game. What were you watching at the time when you were designing the character and designing the world of Monkey Island? Uh, what was I watching at the time? Um, I, you know, I remember uh, things like Twin Peaks had just kind of come out, you know, during production. Um, it was the kind of thing that we would take a break from, you know, our crunch mode and we would all come over to my apartment and we'd all watch Twin Peaks together. So it was one of those things that, that was kind of influential, you know, David Lynch and stuff. Um, there's the Simpsons, you know, the Simpsons had just come out. It definitely watching The Simpsons was a, was a kind of a team break. You know, we would all go watch The Simpsons. So things like that were going on. I mean, I was very influenced by movies like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, I was also very influenced by movies like Blazing Saddles. You know, these kind of weird, almost non sequitur, you know, comedy games. And, you know, if you look at the ending of... Um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know, the police show up and arrest everybody. There's the end of Blazing Saddles where they where they, they bust through to this movie studio set and the whole thing just goes off the rails at that point. And that really appealed to me, right? And if you look at the end of Monkey Island 2, I think you can absolutely see the, the um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail and the Blazing Saddles influence, you know, to that whole ending for me. Yeah, what I what I love about that is it it's sort of just that fourth wall breaking moment where you go like this is all absurd. You realize that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of what the f moment. You know, this is this thing happens as the audience, you're going, what the f is going on now? But it's funny, right? It's not that it's not like sometimes like in a murder mystery, they pull the carpet out from under you and you feel like you were cheated. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh. I never would have figured out this guy killed him because it was, you know, stupid reasons. Um, but when you know, with Blazing Saddles and you know Holy Grail and hopefully Monkey Island too, when that carpet was pulled out from out from under you, you don't feel cheated because you're just so amused by it and it's so interesting and entertaining on its own right that that the story does jump to a different track, but you're happy to be on that track. I mean, I think that just speaks to you know, Mel Brooks, for example, being very aware of what entertainment is mm -hmm. and uh, like a silent film, silent movie, another example where it's such a fourth wall type of movie. Um, and maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's some ethic there. Like, do you, did you, was there some part of you that didn't want people to take your games too seriously um well i mean they're comedies right so i don't i don't want people to get um you sucked into the melodrama of what's going on too much um, i do want them to be having fun and laughing and those things um so so yeah i mean yeah i don't want them to take it seriously right i mean they're not serious games mccallan is not this poignant game about 
piracy or something, right? I don't, I don't want you to come out of Monkey Island with deep feelings about, you know, what was going on. It's, it's, it's a comedy, which is a little bit different than Return to Monkey Island, which is, um, there were actually some really interesting themes going on with that that I did really want players to think about. I wanted them to not think about it just as a comedic thing going on, but there are themes about growing old and what storytelling means. And those were kind of serious things with that game, but but not not with the first two games. I mean, does that just come naturally with age? Yeah, I mean, a lot of Return to Monkey Island, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, self, you know, autobiographical in a way, right? I mean, Guybrush is getting older and the world is changing around him, you know, and, you know, Dave Grossman and I are getting older and the world is changing around us. And, you know, we both still make games, but it's not the same world anymore that we're making games in. And, and that was, we really wanted to reflect that with Guybrush, you know, that he's, he's a pirate and he's going off to do his thing, but it's not the same world that he's really used to. And you know, having you know Guybrush and his son um, interacting and having the game be a story that he's retelling to his son um, is kind of a was really interesting to us because it was like, well, what what is storytelling? What is narrative? And what what are our memories, right? Because people, especially with things like Monkey Island, there's, there's a bunch of nostalgia and people remember Monkey Island and one and two very different than they actually really were. And, and it's, so that, that really kind of got into, well, there's, there's the story. I mean, Guybrush is telling us in the story. How true is that? How much of his stories are he even remembering correctly versus how much of the stories are just being corrupted by his son? You know, Guybrush says at the beginning of Return of Monkey Island, um, when 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 Boybrush shows up, he says, "You always play the end of the Big Wolf story really weird, right?" And so it's like, well, is that just his son playing it weird? And to me, that's kind of a reflection about me kind of looking at players when they play Monkey Island. They just remember things very differently, you know, than than they were because a lot of these people were. 10 years old when they played Monkey Island. And they just had this whole different kind of experience when they're that young playing this game. And um, and, and I, did, I mean, those are the two themes that are really running through Return to Monkey Island. So there is, yeah, there is a very serious component to Return to Monkey Island. Well, let's go back to Monkey Island 1. Uh, when you were designing the Guybrush character, was that you back then? Um, I think, you know, Guybrush's character really came out of that feeling that adventure games work really well if, if they're kind of absurd. And having Guybrush be this, like, fish-out-of-water character, right? And that really came very directly from me reading On Stranger Tides because... I was kind of struggling a little bit with, well, what is the story and who is Guybrush and who is the antagonist and all this stuff. And then when I read on Stranger Tides, the thing that really resonated with me with that book was the main character in the book, he is a fish out of water, right? He's not a well-established pirate. And, and it kind of occurred to me that the best thing to do with adventure games is, is the player um, should be learning at the same time the main character is learning. And that's where it made a lot of sense to me to make, um, to make Guybrush not be a pirate, but he's somebody that wants to be a pirate. So he can learn about being a pirate at the same time the player is learning about being a pirate. And I think that just leads to a character that can be a little bit more um, kind of a, I mean, buffoon's the wrong word, but he can be somebody that can mess things up because he doesn't know what's going on, right? If, if Guybrush showed up being a, a real competent pirate, he couldn't do weird things. And, and so I think that is really what pushed 
um, you know, Guy Bush's character into being a lot, you know, a lot, a lot funnier and a lot stranger. Your reading of On Stranger Tides, does that come from uh, a general interest that you have in piracy, uh, boating? Is there any kind of overlap there with your personal interest? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I, I get horribly seasick. I could never go out on a pirate ship. You know, I, I wanted to do pirates when I first did um, the design for, for Mickey Island before um and Jones happened. Um, to me, that was that was a very conscious choice because, I mean, much like today, um, the thing that sold really well back then was kind of fantasy. People loved fantasy, and I really didn't like fantasy. I didn't read fantasy. I wasn't you know big into fantasy movies, but it was kind of what was selling really big. And what occurred to me is there are there are pirates. And pirates, at least, you know, the kind of Disney-esque, you know, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean pirates, there was a big overlap between fantasy on these people. And it kind of occurred to me, well, I can do a game about pirates. I can leverage off of a lot of what people liked about fantasy, but not be fantasy. And so that's really where the pirates came from, right? I was not a, a big pirate person as a kid and you know always dressing up and stuff like that it was really about that i mean i really enjoyed the pirates of the caribbean ride but that was really about all of my interest in pirates before um, monkey island came about so you you've designed this game uh did you have a proposal for this one when you went to lucas arts with it or did it just happen the same way that you talked about uh, Main Eight Mansion just kind of happening organically when enough people get interested? Yeah, I, th I think it was. I mean, I remember having a lot more conversations with, with Steve Arnold about the game, um, but there was never a, a pitch process, right? I never pitched the game. And there was never some big green light approval meeting that had to happen with the stuff. So I, I think it was that. I mean, I do remember, you know, when Steve... When I when I did talk about making this a real game, you know, one of the things Steve says, okay, but we need to have it done by Christmas, right? Because the 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 whole video game market was driven by Christmas, you know, going out and buying things in stores, and and he really wanted this game out by Christmas, right? Because I don't know, he needed product out or or whatever, um, and so it's like, yeah, let's build this game, but you have to have it done by Christmas. So that was the big decision that I had to make is, can I get this game done by Christmas? Did, did that happen? I mean, and how much yeah. time did you have in the end? Yeah, no, we finished the game probably in late September, early October, somewhere around there. So yeah, it did, it did go out by Christmas. And, and you know, coming out with a game by Christmas doesn't mean you finish the game on the 24th of December, right? It means you finish the game in October at the latest because of, you know, manufacturing process and shipping it to stores and all this stuff. So um, it was finished in, in I, I think, late September. Um, I don't have an exact date. It's like I have some little archival discs I made, you know, of the whole game, archiving it off, and those are dated late September, so it's probably around then. So was that a total of nine months of production? Yeah, it was nine months. Yeah, They're actually absolutely crazy. Yeah, that we got the whole thing done in nine months. Uh, that's unbelievable. Um, so uh, when it came to the um, the graphic design, um, did you did you have a say in how Guybrush and the other characters were designed visually? Because there's the pixel art is so um, there's so much character to it, and you have close ups in the game, right? So you get your kind of cinematic moments as well. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you guys come up with the pixel art for the characters? Well, there was no pixel art, right? That, that was not a term that anybody used at the, at the time. This, the, the art in Monkey Island was AAA state-of-the-art graphics, right? And, and some people forget that. It's like, we weren't doing pixel art. We were doing art. Um, had we had higher resolution, we would have used it, you know? So, it was, it was really kind of working just within the, I mean, much like it is today. I mean, any big AAA game is working within the constraints of technology. 
and they're trying to always push that technology. And we were doing the same thing. You know, we were working in the constraints, but we were trying to push that technology as far as we could, given the hardware limitations that we had. Um, the the art style for for Makian, um, I really have to attribute all that to Steve Purcell. You know, he he was the artist on the project, and you know he he did those backgrounds and he designed um, you know Guybrush and virtually every other character in the game. And it was all it was always stuff where he would do stuff and I would come by in his office and 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 look look at what he was drawing and say, yeah, I like this, I don't like this, do more of this, let's shy away from this. Um, you know, and, and Guybrush himself, um, I don't know how long Steve spent working on it, but he was always passing me floppy disks. How about this guybrush? How about this guybrush? How about this guybrush? You know, and I would go through and kind of pick the one that I liked the most. Uh, did any of Steve Purcell's artwork, um, well, you, you mentioned the chicken pulley <laughs> becoming a gag because he made he made the art of a chicken pulley. Mm. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people want to know like why he made that because <laughs> I mean, as a kid, I, I had no idea what I was looking at. Yeah, I think you'd have to talk to Steve about yeah, that. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> fair. Uh, did any of his uh, character designs then dovetail into the game design and writing for you, or was it just sort of a one-way hierarchy? No, I, I think it's always a two-way street, right? I mean, everything is a two-way street for that stuff, whether it's Supercell doing the art or whether it's other people doing writing or the programmers programming the stuff or even the musicians doing stuff that... It, it really, it has to be a true race, uh, a two-way street, right? I mean, people kind of, you know, sometimes wonder or or think that every idea in Monkey Island came from my head, right? That does I had these ideas and I impart them on other people, but that's just not true. I mean, if you look at something like Monkey Island, maybe a quarter of the ideas in that game are mine, and the rest of the ideas are other people on the team, um, and. You know, even the testers, right? The testers would have weird ideas for the game that you know, we would incorporate back into the game because, oh, that's a really good idea. And I think when you're doing any creative process, you know, you as, as a project lead, which I was, isn't, isn't about me coming up with the, uh, all the ideas. It's about me being the filter. It's like taking all these ideas that people have and deciding this one works and this one doesn't work. And, and that's really what being a project lead is really about. It's just filtering, hopefully, this fire hose of great ideas that the team has about the game. Because if they're excited about the game and they're constantly coming up with weird, strange, interesting ideas, that's a good sign, right? Because they are all fired up about this game. And, and now you, as a project lead, you kind of get to decide which ones work and which ones don't work as you kind of hold this larger vision in your head for what the game needs to be. Great advice for game devs. So you have the 12 verbs in Monkey Island 1. You have a ton of potential combinations. Uh, did this number of combinations come back to haunt you in any way? Um, not really that I remember. I mean, one thing is if you have a lot of different verbs, I mean, nine being a lot, but if you have a bunch of different verbs, and um, a bunch of different objects. One thing you do need to do um, is you need to write kind of fun and interesting things that people try weird things, right? Because it can't be that every item in the game um, responds with uh, that doesn't seem to work unless it actually is supposed to work, right? And, and a lot of the humor um, from a game like Monkey Island can kind of come from descriptions of things and come from incorrectly applying verbs to things. So I think I think we had a lot of work we had to do because of you know the different verbs that you had to use on different things. But I don't really remember the verbs coming back to bite us at any point in the game. Very rewarding when I would try something that I was, I, you know, I would go and play this game at my friend's house because he had a 486. I had a 286. Yeah, Couldn't really, yeah <laughs> with, with a turbo button. 
<laughs> make it go to 166. I think it went from 133 to 166. Uh, I would try sometimes, you know, I would try things that were just like ridiculous. And he'd say, that's not, that's ridiculous. That's a stupid idea. I'm like, no, watch. And we would be rewarded with a funny response. Mm, yeah. And so you're rewarding failure, <laughs> but you're rewarding absurdity, really. It's like, mm. you're sort of rewarding people for getting the joke. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you're rewarding them for poking the world, you know, which, which you kind of want people to do. And it's, it's, it's a natural thing you have to do in adventure. Right? You have to go poke the world. And um, people don't want to poke the world and get their hand slapped and poke the world and get their hand slapped. Um, they want to poke the world and laugh. So that does require a certain amount of trust in the audience. First of all, that they will <clears throat> understand your jokes um, by making these strange associations at times and also trusting that they are going to be able to understand your puzzles because you've written Monkey Island essentially so that there's no way that you can lose the game. So there's always a way out. Um, so that level of trust for the audience, you know, in film, producers sometimes balk at the idea that you can trust the audience. They want to hand the audience things. So for example, like a joke, you see sometimes trailers will like, they'll do a joke and then they'll cut to people laughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just to remind you that what you just saw was a funny joke and you should join in on the fun. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but you're not doing that. You don't have, a, you don't have, you know, you don't have a, a laugh track, right? You don't have anything like that. So at the time, was there a general sentiment in the game development world that the audience can be trusted? I don't think there was a conscious thing, right? We didn't go, we can trust the audience. Let's do this. I think we just kind of did it and, you know, we we did play test sessions with people. Um, we, were, we brought people in to play the game and we watched them play the game. And, and we did get a sense of whether our puzzles were working or whether our humor was working, you know, with that, with that, with those sessions. So it's not like we were building this in a, in a black box. And, you know, everyone else in the games group was playing the game. You know, Noah was playing the game and David was playing the game. Even though they weren't, they didn't work on the game, um, they were still playing it. Um, and we were getting feedback from them about the humor and stuff. And, um, I mean, hu humor is hard. You're never, you're never quite sure what's going to land. But, you know, it's okay if 20% of your jokes don't land, you know, and the rest of them do. Um, because you're just trying different things out, trying to see what's what's going to work and not going to work. But yeah, we, I mean, we never consciously said we're going to trust the audience. But but I think I think you have to. You know, it's one of the reasons I don't like to watch sitcoms. It's like I do not watch sitcoms with laugh tracks, because I feel like it is me being told laugh now. You know, the audience is laughing or the the, the laugh track machine is laughing. Um, and I just, I, 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 I like comedies that do trust the audience. Like I'm, I much, much prefer what they call single, single camera um, comedies because they are kind of trusting the audience a little bit because they don't have that laugh track there to nudge them along. At the time, um, let's go on to the insult fighting. At the time, you know, Sierra and these other games have sometimes they have these very difficult puzzles that require fast reactions. Mm -hmm. uh, you die a lot. It's very punishing. And my 286 sometimes couldn't handle this. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be able to click quick enough. The timing would end. And uh, was your decision to use the insult swashbuckling due to hardware restrictions or was there some other motivation? Yeah, there's no no hardware restrictions. That that didn't kind of play into what we were doing. Um, you know, I I didn't enjoy, especially in the Sierra games, I didn't enjoy the little action sequences that happened. It always seemed weird to me because you're you're setting me up to play this puzzle solving game where I'm using my brain to think my way through problems, and then oh, all of a sudden I have to do this action thing, and I didn't really enjoy that very much, and. The insult sword fighting kind of came from one of the things we did early on in the project is we got together as a team 
and we watched old pirate movies um, just to kind of immerse ourselves into what was going on. And, and we were watching, I think it was like an old Errol Flynn pirate movie. And the thing that occurred to me watching this movie was that these pirates spent a lot more time taunting each other than they actually did sword fighting each other, right? It was them um, on the ship deck or, or climbing up the rigging and they were just insulting each other. Just, you're going to do this. And, and that was where that, that kind of light bulb went off in my head. It's like, hey, wait a minute. We can do sword fighting as a puzzle, right? Because the puzzle is going to be what are the insults that I'm slinging at the other person? And so that's where the insult sword fighting really came from, which is the desire to do action in the game without requiring any action from the player. So where were you getting your insults from? Uh, the insults, all of the insults in Monkey Island were written by Orson Scott Clark, the author. Um, and for reasons that I don't really know, he was hanging around the games group at the time. And he wasn't really working on anything. We weren't working on a game with him, but he was just hanging around. And, you know, he's a, he's a very smart guy and he's a very good storyteller. And he held some seminars where he kind of, you know, talked about storytelling uh, with us that were really interesting. And he was just there and, you know, talking to him about the idea of insult sword fighting. He's like, I can write those, let me write those. So he wrote all of the insults for insult sword fighting. Can you talk briefly about the music design process and what that collaboration looked like? Yeah, you know, I, I know absolutely nothing about music. Absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really even understand what a beat was until much later in my life, you know. And so uh, I, I don't know anything about music. And, you know, when, when Michael Land you know, I came on the project, um, I really kind of had to trust him to do this because I really couldn't give him any real meaningful feedback except I like this and I don't like this. I don't know why I don't like this. I don't know why I like this. And so I really did trust him. And I think one of the first things I said to him was, I kind of like this kind of Calypso you know, steel drum stuff. I like that. It's fun music. Um, so kind of start with that as a theme from it. But I really did just trust him to do what he needed to do. And he kind of came back with pieces and I go, yeah, I like this. And yeah, I don't like that. And, and he would kind of adjust. But um, it, it really is just about trust, you know, uh, to do those things. So in the end, what was the puzzle that people got stuck on the most in Monkey Island 1? Oh, Monkey Island 1? Ooh. And I mean, putting together the potion to get to Monkey Island was, was a little bit difficult only because it's a little bit of a escape the room puzzle, right? You're, you're stuck on that ship. And the substitutions that you make, um, they couldn't be totally obvious because because you were in this escape the room game, essentially, that people would just burn through them really quickly. So they had to be a lot of strange things. And so I think, I think that tripped up a lot of people um, was, was the, the potion to get the Monkey Island. So when you, uh, when you then go on to do Monkey Island 2, uh, why did you redu reduce the number of verbs to nine verbs? I think that's, that's just streamlining. It's just kind of realizing, oh, well, these are wasted verbs. You know, we never used it. Um, so there's just no point in doing it. It's just streamlining uh, the stuff away. Can you talk briefly just about, talk about what is involved in writing an adventure game, a point and click adventure game that, pre that prevents the player from getting blocked? I mean, you just, you want to make sure that your puzzles are logical you know it's like it's like i've always said if you get stuck on a puzzle and you eventually solve it or your friend tells you the solution or you look it up in a hip book the re the the correct reaction should be oh i should have thought of that right um not 
oh, what the hell were they thinking, right? And so when you're kind of constructing puzzles, you want them to be hard. You want them to be, you know, kind of mentally challenging, but not not ridiculous, right? The whole, I don't know where the term comes from, but the moon logic thing, which a lot of adventure games um, get criticized for. And I think I think post Monkey Island during the during the you know the the 90s with the kind of explosion of adventure games, a lot of adventure games just fell into this moon logic, and you just want to avoid that. And I I don't I don't know how to avoid that. I don't know how to say that. I think that's just that's just a part of this kind of instinct of what happens you know with with good puzzles, um, being a good puzzle designer. Right, whether you're doing adventure games or, you know, whatever puzzles, that there's just kind of this instinct that develops over time about, okay, well, this is not a moon logic puzzle. This is a proper puzzle. And, and sometimes, you know, we would build puzzles which kind of crept into the moon logic territory. And sometimes that was solved not by redesigning the puzzle, but, but, but by going to a previous point in the game and just making sure that there's a little bit of a clue, that there's somebody, some character can just say something which kind of helps you. Or you design a little puzzle that seems meaningless, but it's teaching people something they need to know for the puzzle later on. So it's a very iterative process, right? You don't start at the beginning and go to the end. You kind of start at the beginning and you're always going back, changing and and adding puzzles to help explain things or adding narrative or characters to help explain things. Yeah, uh, I, I was punished for not looking around enough because for days I missed the sign with the shovel on it. And I just didn't look at it because I was like, why would I look at it? I know exactly what I know exactly mm -hmm. what I'm looking at. And then you right. can pick the shovel up off of it. So you would so by doing that, you incentivize people to look around and explore the world and poke it, like you said, right? Yeah, no, I think I think that's really important. You know, as as we watched uh, people play games, especially uh, you know, like doing Thimbleweed Park and Return to Monkey Island, as we watched um, people play testing the games, that that was that was this one thing. The people that struggle the most were people who were not inquisitive that you need to be inquisitive into the world and, and poke things and see what happens. And there's so many cases during playtesting when it was frustrating because I, I, would, I would listen to the players articulate something they thought should work and then immediately go, oh, that probably won't work and not actually try it you know, when it was really the solution to the puzzle at that moment. So I think adventure games work well with players who, who are inquisitive, you know, who want to poke the world and see what the breaking point is uh, of the world. Do you, do you think that, um, this is going to sound, it might sound mean, but do you think that funny people are better at playing Monkey Island? <laughs> Uh, I I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I think you have to appreciate humor, right? I mean, if you're a that's a, yeah, that's a that's a more fair way. Of, yeah, you know, you're 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 obviously not going to enjoy it. You're probably going to roll your eyes a hell of a lot more than you probably should. Um, but I mean, that's true of movies or TV shows, right? I mean, if you if you appreciate um, the humor, um, you're going to enjoy. I mean, there are people that friggin hate monty python right and i can totally see why they do right monty python is a very specific type of humor um i particularly love that type of humor some people don't yeah i used to um I used to watch mr bean with a friend and she uh she hated it because he was so stupid which is interesting because i love monty python and i hate mr bean I oh why is that i just i i because, yeah, maybe it's just that he's, he's stupid, but not in a productive way, right? Guybrush is stupid, but he's, 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 he's got a strong heart. He wants to do the right thing. He's kind of a little bit stupid in some areas. But Mr. Bean just feels like he's just stupid. So I just, I, I, don't, I don't like Mr. Bean. 
Yeah, I think I think people who like being uh, they like being because it sort of satisfies this um, sociopathic street <laughs> that might be hiding beneath. You know, like mm-hmm. it's a very interesting critique of uh, of being though, um, and it sort of it sort of sheds light on you know who like if somebody were to make a Mister Bean game who thinks like Mister Bean, maybe they would be kind of mean to the audience there might be some punishment there yeah and there could be you know some some good humor in that like i think doing a mr bean game um there is a certain style of puzzle that would work really well in a in a mr bean game i think you need to be very careful when you're insulting the audience because you you need to make sure that you're insulting them without making them feel stupid Right, there's kind of a, a line, and I think you know Guybrush really ch- treads that line a little bit, in that we don't ever try to make the player feel stupid for Guybrush doing weird things, but um, you can still kind of laugh at yourself because you actually thought of this dumb thing and you laugh at Guybrush, but I think it's mostly about laughing at Guybrush, not at yourself as the player. What was the overall production timeline for Monkey Island 2? Um, both those games were done in less than a year. Was it harder for Monkey Island 2? Or... You have a hard mode as well, so you added some work for yourself, yeah? No, that's not true. We we have an easy mode where we removed a bunch of work. It's like you you build hard mode first, and then you cut a bunch of puzzles to make easy mode. Were you at all involved in the translation of the game for other territories? Because I have a friend who speaks French and he said that the monkey wrench joke <laughs> might've been lost on, you know, non-English speaking people. Well, I think the monk, the monkey wrench joke is lost on non-Americans because the a monkey wrench is very much an American thing. Like in England and Australia, where they speak English, it's called a spanner. And um, yeah, I think if there was any puzzle I regret, it's that one. Um, ju- just because of that. Because, you know, we didn't really think about it. We, we really had done no translations before. Um, the market was, I mean, it was an international market, but they're very isolated, right? It's not like today where you have the internet where, Germans and Italians can all get together and to kind of discuss your game as, as one group. Um, we just, we didn't have exposure to that stuff. And so it was just, it was something we just did not think of at the time. And we certainly do now. I mean, there are lots of, I shouldn't say lots, but there were some puzzles in Return to Monkey Island where we really thought about how is this going to translate? And, you know, have to change the puzzle a little bit because there really is no proper translation for what for what we want to do at the end of the game you can call the hint line when you're lost in the woods in the in the jungle which i loved because i used to call that hint line all the time i probably spent about i probably spent about 300 dollars calling that hint line <laughs> and uh and i remember I, I think her name was chester she would pick mm-hmm. up every time and uh the line was never busy i think i was the only guy calling it at a certain <laughs> point and then she's in the game she actually answers the line Mm -hmm. uh whatever happened to chester she was so she was so nice yeah well she's based on a real person i mean chester is based on uh chris brown who is a real person and uh did uh tech support stuff at lucasfilm at the time and i mean chris is very interesting because you know after lucasfilm she gravitated towards uh directing voice acting and she was actually the director for all the voice acting in Return to Monkey Island. Uh, I don't want to get you fired from anywhere or get you uh, served any kind of uh, legal notices, but was there ever a Star Wars point and click game on the menu? There there wasn't officially, but we all wanted to make one. But it, it never really happened. And, and I think the we all wanted to make Star Wars games. It's like all of us were huge Star Wars fanatics. And um, George at the time had basically licensed all of the video game rights to Star Wars out to other people. So we could not make Star Wars games. 
which is really ironic. It's like, here we are, a part of Lucasfilm, um, and we can't make Star Wars games. But I think that actually worked to our advantage, right? If we could have made Star Wars games, there would be no Monkey Island or Maniac Mansion or anything else. We would have just made Star Wars games. And I think you do see that, right, in the later LucasArts when they actually could make Star Wars games. That's all they made was Star Wars games. Yeah, they and the, those point and clicks probably wouldn't have been very funny. Probably not. Although I think we would have found a way. <laughs> so at the time, you know, you were, uh, it was basically just LucasArts and Sierra as the two big players in the point and click scene at a certain mm -hmm. point. What was the relationship like between the two companies? Were you playing each other's games and were you, you know, were you meeting up for coffee the way the two political parties do in Washington? Um, well, we were in very different cities. Um, Lucasfilm was, you know, north of San Francisco up in Marin and Sierra was um, somewhere in Central California, Oakhurst or something. And so there really was no way we could actually meet up for coffee. Um, I don't know whether they played our games or not. I imagine they did. We certainly played their games a lot and um, their games definitely influenced, you know, what we were doing in our games. Um, we did at, at some point, and I can't remember exactly how it happened, but we started talking to the Sierra people and we decided to challenge them to a, a baseball game. And um, at the time we were working up at Skywalker Ranch, which is kind of up in the hills. And we actually had a little baseball field that was you know, in the ranch itself. And so they, they brought a bunch of people up and we had a big baseball game that we, we played with them. And um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a, a rivalry between Lucasfilm and Sierra, but that rivalry didn't really extend to us as people, right? There was a players, you know, Lucas players hated Sierra and Sierra players hated Lucas and, and stuff. But, but I, I think the, the relationship between us, um, there, there was not a rivalry, so to speak. You mentioned in your Google Talks that LucasArts games were more popular in Europe than Sierra games. Um, I think Sierra games sold better in the U.S., though. Why do you think? Can you explain the difference between the two markets? Well, I, I think there's I think there's one difference is <clears throat> the at the time um, the the marketing person that worked at Lucasfilm was a guy named Doug Glenn, and he. I had actually lived in Europe. He'd spent a bunch of time living in Europe. And I think he kind of knew that market a little better. And one of the things that he did, which is very different than Sierra, was he went around to all of the individual countries and struck deals with the distributors in the individual countries. So the Lucasfilm Games had a distributor in Germany and the distributor in um, France and the UK, et cetera. Um, who really could kind of focus on their specific markets for the stuff. Where Sierra, um, I think they license all their stuff to Activision. I mean, not the Activision this today, but the you know previous version of Activision. And I think there's just a little bit of a focus. I think when you have a distributor who, who has a territory, has a Germany or whatever, and they're just a lot more in tune with with their their markets a little bit and i think we also had really good translators you know boris did the german version of me of monkey island um and he was very good and understanding the humor and i i think the translators for those games kind of went a long way and so i think that's kind of why we established ourselves very prominently in europe but yes sierra i mean sold five times as many copies of anything we ever sold in the US. Um, you know, I look at a, a lot of the kind of fans of Monkey Island um, really come from Europe, not not the US. I mean, that, that did seem to be a big market for point and click adventure games. Um, I started a Facebook group years ago before I got off of it called Point and Click Adventure Fans United, it's still there. And uh, the the members are overwhelmingly European and American. Yeah. And the European ones, they all have LucasArts games. 
Um, and I always thought that was interesting that like, that was such a huge demographic and that it was in, you know, primarily for the four languages. I think my buddy in Taiwan had um, had Taiwanese versions of games too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there were ever any Japanese. Uh, Japan had them as well on FM Towns. I, I don't know exactly why they were much more popular. My guess is it's probably Doug Glenn and how he approached the distribution and the marketing and stuff just gave us a foothold in Germany or in Europe. And I do know, I mean, I don't have any sales figures on Return to Monkey Island or Breakdown or anything, but I know for like for Thimbleweed Park, which I do, we sold um, about the same number of copies of that game in Germany as we did in the United States. Uh, you um, you founded Humongous Entertainment to make games for kids, adventure mm -hmm. games for kids. Mm -hmm. And um, you've talked about the story of just watching a child just open and close doors, which I think was a lot of us with some of these point and click <laughs> games. How do you think people should approach making adventure games for kids today? Um, I, think, I think they should approach it the same way we did with Humongous. I, I don't know that you really could make adventure games for kids today. Like, I don't think that Humongous could have been a successful company today. And I think a lot of that is just because, um, and you even saw this at the very end of Humongous, that the, the kids market just became saturated with licensed products. And it was really about taking successful cartoons um, or kids' movies and turning them into games. And we had a little bit of that. You know, Disney was certainly making the Lion King game and stuff, um, but it really just became saturated um, at that point. And, and I think if you, if you built kids' games today, you would really struggle against the kind of licensedness and also kids have access to you know, phones and tablets now. And I've watched kids play games. There, there's so much for them to play that they have an attention span of about five minutes. That they'll play a game on their, on their mom's phone and then five minutes later they're playing another game and then another game and another game. And you know, we, we didn't have that problem, right? Because you, you actually had to go buy the game and bring it home. And so they, they just didn't have a lot of choice. There weren't a hundred games on their computer to play in any given moment. And it allowed them to focus a little bit more, um, which you know made those adventure games work. So yeah, I, I don't know that you could do it today. I mean, if I, if I was a parent and I had a kid, I would certainly want to introduce them to the humongous entertainment stuff and, and people do right I, I do get email or i just see stuff on social media where you have parents today that grew up playing the humongous games and they're introducing them to their kids and their kids really like them right there's there is there is an appeal to those games that is that is kind of consistent um but i, I don't i don't know how you would how you would kind of do it you know one of the characters that stuck out to me was a uh, spy fox um and um it's a cool character what is cool to kids nowadays would spy fox be cool if you put him in front of a kid today yeah no he's very much kind of based on that you know james bond secret agent -y type and i don't think that's a big thing nowadays with kids I think if you wanted to build a cool character for kids, you know, it, it, he would be a, a YouTube streamer, right? That's that's kind of what kids want to be in in some ways. So, um, yeah, I, I think you know what is cool for kids just changes over time. It's always different. Maniac Mansion was uh, released as uh, Maniac Mansion Deluxe in two thousand four. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your views on fan remakes? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 generally in favor of them. I I don't have a problem with it. I mean, I I wouldn't want to release a game and immediately have a fan remake, right? Games are very expensive. They're very expensive to make, and we you know we do need to make our money back. We need to kind of pay for that stuff. And you know, I wouldn't want somebody usurping a game immediately. But I mean, certainly with all the you know Lucas Arts kind of stuff, um, it's been so long. Um, if people are going to make fan remakes, then 
Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm all in favor of it. You were a writer on Day of the Tentacle. What was your overall involvement with that? I had virtually no involvement in Day of the Tentacle. Um, when when that when that game started, uh, I told you know Dave and Tim and Peter at the time, it's like make it about time travel and make it so you can go back in time and solve puzzles by changing the past, right? That was kind of my own thing. And then I think I told them not to fuck it up. But I think those are the those are the two pieces of advice I had for them. But I left Lucasfilm uh, very quickly after that started. So I didn't really have any involvement. In Can I ask why you left? Because I wanted to build Humongous Entertainment. And it was, a, it was an idea that I kind of pitched a little bit of doing adventure games for kids to, to Lucasfilm. And they just, they had no interest in it. And um, I mean, there's a little bit of like, I felt in my career, I was ready to kind of start my own company. You know, I wanted to, to you know, fall out of the nest, so to speak, and see if I could fly. And so there was that really, that was that piece of it. And I really wanted to do these adventure games for kids and there really wasn't support for doing that at Lucasfilm. So that kind of became a natural thing to do. What was your involvement in the, um, the graphic and voiceover remasters of Monkey Island 1 and 2? Uh, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't find out about them until they were literally a, a couple weeks from being released. Wow. Uh, what was your what was your response to those? How did you feel about them? I was glad they were being re-released. Um, it's a lot harder to kind of get old games back then than it is today, and so I I thought it was great they were being released because I think they were going to kind of introduce a, a whole new crop of players to them. I was very, very happy that they did the mode where you could switch between the original graphics and the new graphics, which I was not a huge fan of the new graphics, um, but I was very happy that they had, they had um, allowed you to switch back to the originals. And what about your involvement in uh, Tales of Monkey Island at Telltale? Again, not very much. You know, they contacted me uh, really towards the end of development of the first episode um i did come in and i had a little brainstorm session with them but i think it was it was too late to really have um significant changes uh you did the cave in 2013 um mm -hmm. there's a parallel with maniac mansion with the multiple characters um was the puzzle design process similar to the maniac mansion process i mean it's a little bit different i mean i certainly had a lot more experience at that point to kind of doing the puzzles um, I think the cave, the cave is interesting because um, there's a, a large component of that game that it's a platformer. And so I had to marry these kind of adventure game puzzles with this kind of light platforming that happens. So the cave is about exploring an environment. Um, and we had some restrictions that I didn't want this game to be about inventory management. And so basically there's, everybody has a one slot inventory, right? It's what they're holding in their hand. Um, but because you have three characters, you really have a three slot inventory. And a lot of the puzzles were about um, positioning the characters correctly, you know, picking up the stuff in the right order, understanding that character A needs to do something before character B uh, does it. So a lot of the puzzles are really kind of focused on those things, which is a little more of the focus of the puzzles of Maniac Mansion, but not at all of the games after. So with Thimble, Thimbleweed Park, it really felt like you were trusting the audience in the same way that you trusted them, trusted us with Monkey Island 1 and 2. Um, is this by virtue of it being a Kickstarter based game and you had direct a direct line to the audience this time? No, I think that's just naturally how I do games, right? I, 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 I am a little more trusting that the people can figure stuff out. I really dislike games that want to hold my hand through the whole process. Um, and I think that, 
you know, things like tutorials and games have, in some games, have reached kind of an extreme. And I think a lot of this comes from mobile games and very kind of casual players playing games that they really do need to be handheld through this entire process, um, which I, I really don't like, right? I want I want players to figure this stuff out, right? It's, it's not like something is, is a horribly obscure and I want you to figure out. It's like you can figure this out just by experimenting a little bit. Um, so I think that's just me naturally. Um, kind of wanting to trust the players because I want I want games to trust me. Was your uh, puzzle design process any different this go around than in previous games? No, it's it's the same process. It's very much rooted in those puzzle dependency charts and putting them together and a whole lot of brainstorming with people. And I don't do well designing games in a vacuum, right? I'm not the kind of person that can sit on my typewriter and you know type out something i really i need people i need to bounce ideas off people and to riff with people and 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 use all that energy that comes with that to kind of focus everything and you know thimbleweed park was very much that he was gary and i you know riffing off each other and then later on david fox um you know doing that doing that um, kind of works well for me there's some uh, there's some commentary uh, in the game about you know the plight of the small American town uh, and uh, is this inspired by anything uh, in your own life and uh, where you are where you're from? I mean I am from a pretty small town you know La Grande Oregon is where I grew up and it's like ten thousand people when I when I grew up there and I think it's still ten thousand people I don't think it's changed much. Um, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily a town that was dying and collapsing and stuff like Thimbleby Park is or other things. I think I think Thimbleby Park was more inspired a lot by, you know, through from David Lynch, you know, and looking at his movies and, and the town is, um, you know, things like Blue Velvet. I really love that movie and that weird, strange little town that they're existing in or Twin Peaks, you know, that town. So I think it's, it's kind of driven by that more than it is my personal experience with anything. And this time you have a, you have a voiceover track through the whole game. Did you direct the voiceover? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about the casting process and what what it's like directing voices for the game that you've made. Yeah, I mean the casting is that was all kind of um, done at a studio that was up in uh, Vancouver. Washington, which is just like a couple hours away from me. Um, and they uh, they did all that. And so they dealt with all the casting. They handled all the casting. And it really is just about you. You create bios of all these people. You know, sometimes there are a couple sentences, sometimes there are a couple paragraphs. Um, and where appropriate, you attach some art to it. And then, you know, that's all kind of given to, this, to the studio. And then they go out and find, you know, actors basically have a you know, casting call um, for actors to come in and to read things. And um, mostly these days, actors um, just provide a, a, you know, they may record, you know, your sample lines and stuff. But they, most actors these days have recording studios at home. And they'll just record that stuff. And then you listen to it and go, oh, I, I like this person. And a lot of times, you know, somebody may read for character A and we hear their read and you go, oh, you know what? They're going to work, work well for character C. I kind of like the tone of their voice or the way they, they brought stuff forward. So, so it's just kind of mixing all that stuff up and figuring out, you know, who's going to read well um, for people. So that's kind of the you know the casting process that that we we kind of went through, which was I mean no different than when we voice casted for the um, Humongous Entertainment games, right? Those were all voiced. Um, the only difference was when we did auditions, people came into the studio, you know, which was nice because people would read lines during the auditions, and I could I could refocus them. I could say, hey read this nicer, read this meaner, read this whatever. 
Um, and we don't really have that choice, you know, when the when the actors are are doing their own auditions, you know, in their home studios. We kind of have what we get. Um, we would definitely call them back, like during Return to Monkey Island, um, people would record stuff and we'd hear it, and I go, okay, you know what? I want them to read a different part now, and I would give things I wanted them to do differently, and they get a little callback. They have to record a, a separate um, session for that. How do you design an adventure puzzle game for modern audiences when attention spans are so short? I mean, that's absolutely something that I thought about a lot. You know, and, and Dave and I spent a lot of time thinking about a modern audience. And it, it is kind of a, a, a needle you have to thread, right? Because you you do have to be conscious that this is a modern audience. They have a much lower tolerance for being stuck on puzzles. Um, you know, when you were playing Mick Allen, you didn't have the internet, right? And you, know, you might have to wait until you went to school to bug your friend about something. But now people have the internet and people notoriously have no patience. So if they get stuck on a puzzle, they're just gonna go to the internet and look it up. That's all they're gonna do. And what we found in Thimbleweed Park was they go to the internet to look it up and you know, one out of 10 times they'll get the wrong solution, right? They'll get bad advice from people. And of course, they blame you for that. And so you you have to, you have to be careful about that. And that's why Thimbleweed Park and also um, Return to Mike Island had a hint book that we wanted to build. We didn't want to build dumbed down puzzles, but we also wanted to keep people from just going to the internet. We want to keep you in the game, you know, in the fantasy of the game. And both of the hint books in Thimbleweed Park and in Return to Monkey Island are hint books that are very much in fantasy. They are things that exist in the world at that moment. Um, it's not popping up a little you know, help menu that comes down. It's, it's the, the book that Guy Burish has or it's a phone call you make in Thimbleweed Park. So it's really about making sure you keep the players in the fantasy that they're currently playing. So I think the hint book was probably the major thing that, that we did. And that was our little escape route if the puzzles were a little bit too complex for people. You think that there is a future where there could be like a, I'm thinking of Elden Ring right now and how mm -hmm. there's this sort of fascination now with extremely difficult games. Do you think mm -hmm. that there's a world where there could be an Elden Ring level difficulty for a point and click adventure? Well, I mean, difficulty is, is really interesting when it comes to playing adventure games versus, you know, action games, right? Is, you know, when I, when I play action games, which I, I do play, it's like I, you know, I really like World of Warcraft. It's not really an action game, but, but there certainly is a, a component to that, that I can get really good at that game, right? I can get good at an action game I'm playing if I'm playing, um, you know, something like, you know, Nuclear Throne, you know, which I enjoyed. I mean, that's an action game. But I can get good at that game by playing it over and over and over and over. You cannot get good in an adventure game by playing it over and over and over, right? You're not going to be a better Return to Monkey Island player by playing Return to Monkey Island over and over and over. Because once you've done it, it's spoiled, right? Maybe you get better by playing a lot of adventure games, but, but there's this... Um, there's a thing about playing puzzle games in particular that you don't get good at them in the same way you get good at playing action games. And I think you can have a game that is punishingly hard as a platformer or an RPG or any kind of an action game because players can get good at it. And I don't think you can have a punishingly hard um, adventure game because I think what that would require you to do is creating more and more moon logic puzzles. Yeah, or requiring more dependence on AI. Um, you know, you touch on AI in Thimbleweed Park also. I mean, is there any mm -hmm. th 
things have changed a little bit since the Moe Park. Is there anything surprising about AI nowadays in your eyes? No, not really. I mean, AI today is, I mean, it's not sophisticated, right? I mean, those those AI engines, I've, I've watched a lot of like YouTube videos about how the AI is creating those things. And they're basically recurgitation engines, right? I mean, they, they take input and they just recurgitate stuff out. Um, so I don't know that anything has changed. I mean, since you know the, the end of the week park, so I think people are more aware of it um, than they were back then. Have there ever been any talks about turning Monkey Island into a film? Uh, I mean, constantly. Um, there was a Monkey Island movie that uh, Lucasfilm kind of started to do. Um, Stu Purcell did a whole bunch of the art for it. That all happened after I had left and I knew nothing about it um, until Steve told me about it much later, you know, long after it was canceled um, and stuff. So, I mean, there certainly has, there's certainly a lot of people who want um, to make a Monkey Island movie or Monkey Island TV show. I don't know how successful those would be. I don't know that I'm really in favor of that stuff happening. Because Guybrush's character is very much rooted as an interactive character, right? And and I and I worry that if you did a Monkey Island movie, that it would become a Mr. Bean movie. That Guybrush works because he's a, he's an interactive component, and he can be a buffoon, but let the players feel really smart at the same time. And I think you lose a little bit of that in a film. Now, the one TV show that I have seen that I think comes the closest to a Monkey Island TV show is the Our Flags Mean Death that was on HBO. Um, and, you know, I, I watched that TV show. Have you seen it? Yeah, you should definitely watch that. Our Flag Means Death. Um, it was streaming on HBO Max or whatever it was. Th that to me kind of comes the closest to a Monkey Island TV show that I've ever seen. Uh, but probably not, probably not Hollywood indie. I, indie. I think, um, you know, games have kind of gotten to the point that that you know people who want to make movies but are doing games can actually come very close to making movies now, um, and. I think that's, I don't think there's an envy so much anymore um, as, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to understand game narrative at a, at a much deeper level than we probably were, you know, um, 30 years ago with that stuff. Because we, we have, we have a, lot, a lot better tools and we also have a much larger audience, right? I mean, Monkey Island may have sold 100,000 copies you know, when the very first one came out, which was actually a really big hit. You know, at the time, um, selling 100,000 copies today would kind of be a failure. So I think there is an audience that millions of people can now play these larger AAA games or even smaller games. And the audience... Um, you know, I think some of the some of the Hollywood envy just meant well, well, everybody's paying attention to movies. Nobody cares about games. But I think today, um, games and movies, I think definitely have a, a very similar um, pull to people. And I, I think the movie industry probably absolutely realizes that um, all, all their competition for dollars anyway is absolutely games. You know this probably isn't a competition in raw storytelling yet, but for dollars, absolutely is. Um, games are a competition. What future do you see with point and click adventure games and what advice do you have for somebody who would wanna make one? I think my, my biggest piece of advice for people who want to make uh, point and click games is stop making old scum games. Stop making games that have the you know the verbs down at the bottom, and and really push forward and innovate. And I think some of the more successful 
you know, indie titles in the adventure game space and narrative space are from people who really push forward, right? They they took the roots of what those games are. You look at a game like Firewatch, right? Firewatch is an adventure game, absolutely an adventure game, but it doesn't look like one and it doesn't play like one. And um, it had a much bigger audience than, you know, Thimbleweed Park did, for example, right? A lot more people played Firewatch than Thimbleweed Park. And it's because they push forward on that stuff. They kind of threw out things and tried new things. And I think if you're going to build a point and click game, get out of nostalgia and and really kind of look look forward and really try to push that stuff forward. People also want to do the pixel art. And I think that they quickly realize how much work is involved in pixel art, even though it is kind of a beautiful art style because like you had mentioned in your Google talk, it leaves a lot to the imagination, which again is trusting the audience Mm -hmm. because in this day and age, the temptation is just to make a meta human and make it a perfectly lifelike person. Mm -hmm. What balance do you think we might be able to strike there? Well, I think the pixel art, which I do enjoy, I really like pixel art and, and I, and I do play games that are, um, pixel art because I kind of like the art style of that stuff. But, you know, Gary Winnick used to always say back in the Maniac Mansion stuff, when he would be drawing a character, he would say, I'm not drawing a character. I'm drawing the icon of a character, right? I'm just drawing this icon and then you're going to pull everything out of this and kind of create that character. And I think that's a real skill with really good pixel artists is they are able to boil those characters down to a 16 by 16 pixel grid, yet you look at it and know exactly who that character is. And my sister is an artist. Um, She does a lot of fine art and beautiful paintings and, you know, sculptures and all this stuff. And I was talking to her just a little while ago about pixel art. And I was kind of showing her, she's not a gamer, so I was showing her some pixel art. And she was kind of looking at this going, wow. She's like, I could not do this. You know, I do these amazing paintings, but there's a skill to doing pixel art that I just do not possess. And it's it's finding the exact right place for a pixel. And that's a skill I just don't have. I'll destroy any art as soon as I start touching it. But I'm always amazed um, watching people build pixel art and I kind of look as they're building this thing up and I'm like, this is junk, this is crap, this doesn't look like anything. And then they drop like one pixel into it. And I'm like, oh, totally looks like it now. And I just, I, I, I think that there's an amazing skill to that, you know, that, um, that, that it, it very much appeals to me, you know, as a, as a, as a person um, looking at pixel art and liking and understanding pixel art. But I think pixel art also, um, there's there's just this kind of nostalgic piece of it. Like I think Thumbway Park definitely suffered in sales because it was pixel art. Because a lot of people look at it and go, oh, it's just an old retro game. It's just an old pixel art game. Um, so I think there's definitely something, you know, to kind of think about. You know, as you're as you're looking at the game, are you gonna use pixel art or not use pixel art? Well, why do you think we laugh? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of like psychology about laughter, right? Are are we laughing because we're uncomfortable? Are we laughing because we're taking an uncomfortable situation and making it okay because we can kind of laugh at it? And there's laughing at the misfortune of others, right? I can laugh because somebody slips on a banana. And it's not me slipping on the banana, but you're slipping on the banana. Um, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't don't really kind of understand um, why we laugh, per se. I know that I need to laugh. I need funny things in my life. I need... Um, you know, funny games and funny movies and funny TV shows. I need that stuff. It's kind of a levity to it all. Um, you know, as the world becomes more serious and more horrible in a lot of ways, it's like I want that laughter. Um, like I, I cannot watch TV shows anymore 
that happen in a post-apocalyptic post world. I cannot watch them. And so I would much rather watch things that are kind of funny. And, and they're not funny in that they're shallow funny, but they can be sophisticated and meaningfully funny, but kind of funny. I, I just, I need that a lot more. I'm always looking to do comedy. And that's tough nowadays because a lot of game producers, they don't, they don't want to do funny. They don't want to do funny games. I mean, I think that's always been a problem. You know, I think funny is, it's, humor is very subjective. And, you know, it's very easy to pitch somebody in a funny game, but then if they don't find what you pitch particularly funny, it's just dead. Um, and so I think it's always been hard to do comedy. I'm, I'm sure the same thing is true. If I want to build a comedy movie or a comedy TV show, it's probably a lot harder than building, than, than pitching something else just because comedy is hard. I mean, I love Blazing Saddles. I know people who just hate that movie, you know? because the humor doesn't mesh um, with them on that stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in such a global distribution model that sales agents and distributors, like when I was selling films back in like 2011 to 2013, uh, they were very concerned about doing comedy. They said, well, Germany is not gonna get it, China's not gonna get it. And I was just like, then then does that only leave like 2 billion people on the, on the planet? <laughs> like, how many, pe how many people do we need to sell this to? So, I mean, I think that that is something that internet distribution has going for it, where, you know, if you make the game the right way, selling 100,000 copies is a total success. Yeah, no, it's, it certainly is. You know, I, I think for a lot of people, I mean, certainly for a publisher, 100,000 copies is probably a failure, you know, given the amount of money and effort. But kind of the rise of indies and that we do have a very... Um, kind of flat distribution system, right? I mean, you can get a game up on Steam. I mean, even Nintendo or the Switch, there's just not a lot of hurdles you have to get through to go do that. And, you know, the phones and everything else, you really can build a strange, bizarre game and get it into people's hands. Ron, thank you so much. This has been a, a huge pleasure. Um, and uh, really love the work that you've done and you've inspired a lot of people. Including yeah, myself. Thank you. thank you very much. No, this is a lot of fun. We had a lot of great questions. So thank you. I enjoyed it. This has been an interview with Ron Gilbert. Be sure to join my Telegram channel at t.me slash Eric Jacobus, where I'm always posting and interacting with the audience. My website is ericjacobus.com, where I post additional material. Please tell your friends about the Action Talks podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. My studio is at superalloyinteractive.com, and be sure to subscribe. Thank you.